Hello and welcome. I'm glad that uh, you know I get the privilege of doing the last one after everybody's all doped up on cookies and <laughs> stuff and ready to fall asleep. Um, <clears throat> just as an introduction, my name is Daniel Marinick. I work for ImageSoft, as you can see by the corporate blue shirts, standard blue tire. Um, I am the product manager for True Filing and also for um, most of our other products. So if you're familiar with the True Sign, which was used to be called iSign, or if you're familiar with um, iDoc Creator or even True Certify, I mean, all those products, unfortunately or fortunately, fall somewhere underneath my domain and jurisdiction. So if you have any complaints and stuff, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Uh, kudos, uh, kudos too, right? Yeah, kudos too. I'll take those as well. Um, what we're going to talk about today is really about um, true filing. Um, it's more or less a case study. I mean, it's not an actual case study per se, but what we're really going to go through are the, um, some of the things that we've learned over the last uh, two years since we've been building um, true filing. And so e-filing in general, um, we're going to look at uh, you know, five of the, sort of the top lessons that we've learned as we went through this. Um, some of it might actually be rather redundant based on some of the things that I know I've heard in some of the other places. So there's a common theme that you're going to probably be hearing um, you know, throughout the day. And you know, in fact, I'm going to, of course, be saying some of those as well. Um, basically, the internal process, we're going to need to address those. Make sure you have that bracing. Yes. Did I turn it off? You muted it. Nice. Yes. All right, let's keep playing tricks on him. <laughs> See how long. Um, embracing inevitable change, you know, bringing on a paperless environment, whether it's just paperless inside the court firewall, um, but even when you bring that to the outside world, there's going to be a lot of change in your community, um, a lot of change with the filers and so forth. Um, ensuring that it's usable, I mean, both from the filer standpoint, but also from the clerks and the court standpoint. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to consider um, when you're building or when you're looking at electronic filing. Um, the fact of starting small but thinking big, you know, you don't want to get overwhelmed with the amount of work that you need to do, but at the same time, you also don't want to look at the, or forget that big picture of what your ultimate goal is um, with an e-filing type of initiative. And then lastly, talking about open communication, how, you know, it's changing now. What used to be a more personal relationship with people coming down and filing in paper, that's now out of, the, out of the way. And so how do you actually still have that personable type open communication um, when you're now no longer having that personal face-to-face -face contact with the filers? And then questions and answers. And I like having my animation, so I apologize for the gratuitous animation. Um, internal processes first. This actually came from um, the state of Michigan has just recently um, gone down the initiative of starting with a statewide system for electronic case or electronic filing. Um, the state typically has been doing it as one-offs, um, but what they've actually noted inside the actual RFP itself, they even cited that case management, electronic document management, electronic content management is paramount for any type of organization, any type of, of uh, court that plans on going paperless. You can't, it's not reasonable to accept electronic filings if you don't have some place to store it. And what they were citing was that 60 courts have some sort of capability. And so if you're one of those courts that don't have that capability right now, then really that should be the first thing that you're thinking of. Um, from a um, getting your own ducks in a row standpoint, that's the most critical piece. If you don't have some place to actually accept these electronic filings, it's not really going to go very far um, at all. So the first piece of advice from what we've seen as being successful has been starting with that clerk and court processes. Um, you need to identify those key participants for it and you need to determine that taxonomy for it. I think we've heard it, I've heard it in a lot of these um, different sessions. Um, if you don't know how you're going to lay out your content, if you don't know how you're going to categorize or keep those electronic filings, if you don't know the disposition rules, or even where the workflow is going to be going, it doesn't matter whether or not you're accepting it from a paper standpoint or if you're accepting it electronically, you're going to fail. And I think that Ottawa County, you know, Dan Kruger is from Ottawa County, they had it, you know, for the last, what, five years? 
they've had that electronic case file. They have had the systems and the processes in place in order to be able to handle electronic cases. Um, and recently, they've gone down the path of doing electronic filing. Um, but the predecessor for that is always going to be in making sure that you're starting with that clerk in court. There's nothing more frustrating to a filer than to trying to file something in electronic format to just have the clerks not know what to do with it or to have to print it off or to have to move it around. Um, you're basically just shoving a whole bunch of stuff to them um, in a manner that they're just not going to be used to and not be able to, to handle. Um, and with that, what we've seen is that an initial launch with paper-based filings only, although it seems rather odd to talk about that with an e-filing initiative, but to actually start with um, taking what is handed to you over the paper, or in a paper format over the counter and instead of stamping that um, you know, with a little stamper and then putting it in an electronic case file and handing it off to, the clerk or to, um, to a judge to be signed in a paper format, at least accepting the paper and then scanning it, getting it electronic from the initial, putting that document onto the side, but making people actually use the electronic system. Because if the clerk's office and if the court and if the judges and if referees, if all the participants that are gonna be using the e-filing documents, the e-file documents, if they're already used to dealing with electronic filings or with electronic content, then you're going to be better off long term. So before you even think about e-filing, you really do need to address your internal processes first. The other thing that we noticed was that having a champion, having a champion, somebody who is spearheading this, you know, we're lucky to have probably the champion for um, Ottawa County right here. Um, and Typically what we found is that it is good to be that judge or court administrator. You know, somebody who is, you know, has that authority to actually make things happen. If you have somebody who's in the clerk's office or, you know, somebody who is, you know, not necessarily going to wield, unfortunately, the power that a judge is going to be able to command, um, it's probably not going to move on or you're not going to get the buy-in from everyone. Again. The process is only as good, electronic filing is only going to be as good as all the participants in there. And if you don't have judges participating, at some point it's going to end up being paper in front of their laps. And if they're signing paper, that just means that you're not going to have to scan that document in. And so if you don't have the full breadth of buy-in, and if the champion isn't coming from the top, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to get things done. The key thing here, though, is it needs to be just one person. What we found is that if you have a committee of people, it's usually not going to work out well in the end. They're going to have conflicting ideas. Um, they might start wavering, and so then somebody's not going to show up, and the other one's not going to feel like as if they can actually make a decision on the other behalf. You need to have somebody that's really going to just take it and run with it and make sure that it gets done. The key piece is, is that even if the judge is not that champion, you need to have their buy-in. Because as I said, you really don't want um, to have you know, your content um, ever going into that paper world. You want them to really live into uh, and buy into the entire process. The other thing is, is that, this is a little redundant, but e-filings, they need to be stored long-term. So if you don't have that back-end system, if you don't have that back-end repository, at the end of the day, you're still held accountable for having e-file documents. Hello. Um, and in this particular case, it doesn't matter whether or not they're in a case folder that's a paper format or if it's going to be in a virtual folder. And so you really have to be thinking that, hey, this content still has to be stored long term. And the e-files would have to be printed if you didn't have that back end system. Any questions on just at least getting your ducks in a row with that? Pretty straightforward. Yes. All right, so embracing that inevitable change. This is the hardest for everyone. Um, I think, again, most of the, the uh, things that I've sat into, they talk about how they never really believed that the benefits of what going to a paperless environment would be. Um, you know, whether it was the friend of the court, whether it was the courts, the, um, you know, the circuit court, district court, um, even judges, even the prosecutors, you know, they never imagined. They thought it would be better, but they didn't really think about how well it was going to be. But that's the thing is that it is, it's change, and change does come with a lot of, you know, fear, you know, involved. And with that, expect internal pushback, even from the champion, the person who 
who, you know, wants to spearhead it, at some point, they too might actually say, well, maybe I want paper for this, or maybe I don't want to go all that far, you know, or maybe that's good enough, or, you know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have to be steadfast, and you have to make sure that, you know, those people are held accountable to what they actually wanted and look at that bigger picture, all right? They may waver, but ultimately, you know, what we found is, is that, you know, through thorough testing, you know, through making sure you can take away those security blankets, you know, Linus, he might hold on to that blanket from now until the end of time, but at some point, the people will start eventually getting rid of paper. Definitely expect external pushback. You know, you are not, you might be in control of what goes on at the court, or you may think you do have control of what's going on in the court and the clerks, but you definitely are not going to have complete control over your filers. And you will have people complaining. You will have people that are resisting the change. The key piece to that is, is that most of them are seeing the benefits and they will adopt. What we found is through explanation as to why this is good for them, explanations as to what the benefits would be, they typically begin to um, understand. We have, for whether it's for Ottawa or even for Grand Traverse and the 13th Circuit Court, um, for those of you that know, well, we're all probably from Michigan, but you know, Grand Traverse up in the, which way would it be for you guys? Up in the, <laughs> up in the little index finger area. Um, we have filers from all over the entire state. So we have filers that are in Grand Rapids that are filing to on the 13th Circuit or filing to Ottawa. We have filers that are in Oakland County. We even have some that are from Wayne County. And what we found is that a lot of them, they're open to this change. They like it, they're embracing it, and it's because it actually saves them um, time and money. And we're all procrastinators. We all are gonna wait until the last second. And if something is due on Friday in the past, in order to get it overnighted, they would have to have it done by Thursday. Well, now, because it's electronic filing, they can wait until Friday. And after being explained that, they actually start to love it. <laughs> the thing is, is that this, there is a small percentage that will continually complain. We actually have a, a known list right now of different law firms and different individuals that we know will consistently complain. And there's not much that we can do to help them because they're just complaining just for the sake of complaining, which is fine. But do also realize that even though that might taper off and even though you might get that list of things, you're continually adding new filers. We had filers that, that have tried filing from um, different states. You know, there might be somebody who is being represented and it was a law firm from um, St. Louis. They have no idea. I mean, they obviously must be able to practice in Michigan, but they clearly did not understand the rules about you know, motions and jury um, you know, demands and the costs associated with it. And they, of course, are gonna be complaining about you know, hey, my, my paper has been, you know, sent back to me, what, what gives? <clears throat> the other inevitable change, and these are the ones that are going to affect you as a court or as the clerks, um, based on just the way that things have been done for, for the longest periods of time. Um, time stamping, electronic signatures, case file, service, certified documents. So, you need to provide a new mechanism of time stamping a document. There's no way that you can take, unless somebody can show me, how you're going to take that monitor and the picture and the image and shove it into that time stamp machine. It's just not going to happen. Um, and with that, though, you need to also think about adjusting when the time stamp gets applied. You know, right now, if somebody comes up to the counter and they're paying for it, you're going to time stamp it right then and there. It's going to be physically marked on the document. There's no question about when that thing was, was stamped. But do you do it when they submit it? Well, that might be too early. You know, maybe the court wants to regulate exactly when these things get time stamped. Too early might mean, you know, they could do it at two o'clock in the morning, you know, from their home on a Sunday. You know, they might be doing it, you know, on a holiday. So you don't really want to do it then. You don't want to do it on docketing. At that point, it might be too late. You know, you, it might be a day later, maybe, you know, you were behind a little bit or somebody's on vacation, something slipped through, um, you know, from that standpoint. Um, you might do it on when you accept it or pay for it. From what we've seen, that last piece, when the court actually tentatively accepts it, maybe before it's been paid for, but when they tentatively accept it, that's when we see um, most 
um, applying the actual timestamp. So it might be available to them. It might have been submitted at a certain time. Um, but when the court actually accepts it or deems it as being accepted. And again, the clerks, they also can look at it and say, okay, well, this thing was actually submitted at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. We didn't get to it until Monday morning. We're still going to stamp it as if it was on Friday. But just realize that the notion of stamping has now changed for you and that you really have to be cognizant about what it means to stamp things. Same thing is true for a valid signature. Um, what's good about this, I don't know how many people, I mean, it's, it's our job, thankfully or unthankfully, um, to actually watch these things, but the Michigan Supreme Court just amended MCR 1.109. Does anybody know what that one is? <laughs> but they actually just amended it on May 24th. So what was that, a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago? And it provides the use. They actually now will allow an electronic signature, which is actually rather humorous because, as Dan will attest, he's been doing electronic signatures for the last four years. Um, and a lot of our customers have been doing electronic signatures for some time. Um, and in some instances, it has been much to the chagrin of SCAO and the Supreme Court. But in reality, the federal government has been accepting these types of things for several years now, probably more than 10 years now. And now Michigan law, though, has just changed. And it actually allows for the use of electronic signature. So it validates the fact that we can actually now use TrueSign. Not that it stopped anybody before, because you had judges that were actually signing things, and the judges are certainly going to hold up their own thing when presented by an attorney that it wasn't actually signed by them. Um, but it also allows notarization by electronic process. So the validation of true sign. So not notary and notary publics can now um, apply via electronic signatures. And so there might be even some changes to um, the true certify. So if you're not aware of that, you know, you can come and talk afterwards about it. But with that, and this is the actual change that they made. So they added a C section for signatures. So these will be available for everybody. Um, <clears throat> But with that, you need to provide some way of doing that type of electronic signature. I mean, if you're getting a document now, it's very difficult, as it says up there. If you think time stamping is bad, think about signing. I don't think people are going to want a marker on their, you know, on their desktop or in their, their um, monitor. And you certainly don't want them to do, as what we said earlier about judges, you don't want anybody to have to print it out, sign it with a pen, and then rescan it back in. The efficiency on that, you, you've completely lost the entire benefits. Which is why we've done um, you know, products like TrueSign. That's why it's been there from the beginning. You know, in order to be able to, to allow a judge's order to be signed, you know, we had to have some sort of mechanism of safely and securely being able to apply a signature, maybe on file, or maybe even using a signature pad, to be able to allow people to sign those documents. Um, when you're talking about electronic filing and e-filing, there are two aspects to this. There's valid signatures from the person who's filing the document and what's acceptable to them, which in, under most cases, it's just going to be the convention of a slash s slash and then their name. And that is deemed through the, the changes to the law that that is um, an acceptable way of, um, of signing a document. But on the flip side, if we wanted to present sort of a wet signature type look, for inside the firewall, that's where something like TrueSign comes into play. This one's the stickler one. This is, <laughs> this is the one that gets, this is the next hurdle, I guess, that we have to get over in the state of Michigan. And um, it was actually brought up in, uh, again, a couple of the other sessions that I was a member of. Um, but what is a valid case file? So right now, the state of Michigan only recognizes paper as being a VAT, well, in microfilm, but paper really is a valid, it was one of the only valid um, forms of, um, of an electronic, of a case file. And it must have original copies, or original, um, the original documents. I guess copy is kind of a weird term. So with that being said, if you accept an e-file document and you print it, that technically, according to the state, is not considered an original. Even though that document never was ever in a paper format, 
not even scanned at the attorney's office, they still deem it as not being an original. And that's soon to be changed. But what that's saying is, is that you'd have to print it per the law. But in reality, even the printed version is not considered original. And with that, you had to get a local administrative order in order to be able to, to allow you to do e-filing. And so I think this was brought up in, did anybody attend the Judge Rogers one? He brought it up in that. He basically said, you have to get a local administrative order in order to make it legal for you to have an electronic case file. And again, bring it back to you know, Dan Kruger and the Ottawa team, they had to go through that same process in order to make electronic filing legal in order to be able to do it because of these, uh, these issues. What it would mean if you didn't get a local administrative order right now is, even if you had a, your, all your processes set up, even if you had all of your workflow and your judges all signing, if they e-filed a document, that would not be considered an original. Even if you printed it, it would not be considered an original. They would still have to paper file you an original, which is borderline deplorable, as the judge would say. The recent statewide initiatives, they are coming out with, or they came out with um, an e-filing um, request for proposals. So there's actually an initiative out there for a statewide system. With that, they are looking at making modifications so that you can have an electronic case file, which is tremendous for all of these initiatives. But just realize that this embracing of inevitable change comes from not only you internal, but even those external people too. Electronic service as well. So the lawyers are so used to how they're doing servicing right now. You know, from a servicing from their standpoint, they're looking at servicing by, yep, okay, I, you know, made 15 copies and 14 of them are gonna be mailed out in the mailbox and one copy is gonna be sent down to the clerk's office. They send the runner out and they go and do that. And on the way to the courthouse, they drop, you know, the 14 off in the mailbox and they drop the one off at the clerk's office. Everything's time stamped, thank you very much, and they walk away. That's very known to them. And in fact, if you actually look at the law, it says that it's the intent of sending it. So just them putting the, the, the stuff in the mailbox is good enough and they have a little proof of service that says that yes, they did that. But in the reality is, is what we've seen is that there are some nefarious activities going on. One of which would be, okay, I, I go down and I drop them off in the mailbox and then I go over to the clerk's office and I go in there and they say, oh, you forgot to sign this or this, doesn't, this date doesn't work. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. So they change it and they sign it and they correct the date and then they hand that one in. Well, the one that they put in the mailbox has all the wrong dates. They're not gonna go through and go through that process of reclaiming. First off, it's illegal to go back into the mailbox and pull them out. And secondly, they're certainly not gonna admit it or to make any changes. And then the other one is, is, all right, well, I drop it off at the clerk's office on Friday afternoon for a Monday motion call. And then I'm gonna go drive to the podunk side of town where I know that the next pickup is gonna be Monday at 4.30 because it's already five o'clock, but hey, it's the intent of serving. So before the mailman even picks it out of the, the, the box, it's already beyond the time in which somebody actually did it. And so what part of what needs to change is the, the openness and realizing when I submit a document to the court, that thing should be immediately served to all parties or as immediate as it possibly can be. Maybe immediate means as exactly when I send it. Maybe it means after it's been accepted by the clerk. Maybe it can even mean after it's been filed with the clerk. But in reality, it, what it does is it's saying that, you know, I'm gonna send this out from a system standpoint and you can't hide about when you actually did it. And in fact, the system can also generate a proof of service automatically for you so that it'll actually show you this is when it was emailed out this is who we emailed it to, and also this, these are the people that actually opened up you know, the, or clicked on the link that was provided in the email. So it has sort of the openness um, and no hiding behind when you actually sent it out. And the intent is now moved from not just intent, but actual somewhat proof of what actually was sent out. Certified documents as well. So again, we're all used to going down to the clerk's office, 
purchasing a certified copy of something, paying the $10, $12, and then having the raised seal on every single you know, um, page. Um, the problem, again, with that is that raised seals don't really work on electronic documents. And also, even if I were to give you a, let's say, a PDF that had all these certifications, all these certificates, and all these great bells and whistles about it being absolute 100% lock solid, nothing's changed on it. The problem is, as soon as I print that, all that's gone out the window. I mean, I now have a print off copy of it, and I can slip in whatever page I want in between. There's nothing to sort of authenticate that that printed off version is exactly what it is. If you haven't seen a demo of True Certify, I would certainly, I'm not going to give you a demo, unfortunately, but I would certainly um, encourage you to talk with either Mike or somebody from the sales team. I'm on the product side, so I can give a demo, but I'm not going to. Um, but this is, provides a way to deliver authentic or authenticatable documents. And Ottawa County, they have done a fabulous job of embracing, actually, they, it, it is more or less your brainchild as far as coming up with the idea of even how to do it. And it's amazing to hear the stories about how many documents you guys have actually done and the use cases for it. So, I mean, there have been people, I guess, like in Nebraska and in Texas and all these different areas that have called up not only ImageSoft but also their courts off or their clerk's office to actually say, is this really legit? You know, is this really what I need? And um, there have only been a handful of people that have sort of complained. I think the birth certificates for the social security numbers at the you know, I've been the, the only ones that have sort of faltered so far, but. All right, any questions on change? No? All right, filer usability. So this is my dig for you guys. You know, consider making it mandatory. What we have noticed is that without it being mandatory, there really is not much of a drive in order to get people to actually use it. And the biggest thing for the mandatory, and the biggest thing that we've actually seen is, is that it does standardize, or it reduces the confusion for the filers even. And it standardizes sort of what their mindset is about what they can do. When you don't have a mandatory, you know, things like the e-servicing, that almost goes out the window. Because if the opposing counsel isn't um, participating and they're not joined in, then we don't have emails or their emails might not be on record. And if only half of the documents are actually in there, then half the documents would be served out, and the other half would have to be still done through paper. And it really just becomes confusing as a filer to know what type of cases they should really be using the system for. Um, and so things like e-service and e-notification, what's good about it also from, a, from the court side is, is that confusion is also taken away, but it does allow them to provide the ability to automatically send out e-notifications. So as an example, if you look at the 13th Circuit Court, um, what they do is um, on any internal documents that are filed, you know, from their standpoint, if they're doing a, if they're signing a judgment or if they're um, just want to send out a, I don't know, a, an order, th they can use the same set of filers that are on the case in true filing, in the e-filing system. And they can get that list of, of service recipients and send out the notifications. It's not service necessarily in the standpoint of um, serving a document like the lawyers have to do on opposing counsel, but it's definitely notifying them that something has changed on the case. And they can use those emails and those contacts if they didn't have any type of, if they knew that, or if those cases were not mandatory, they wouldn't know if they had an exhaustive list. And so right now, most of them, as a courtesy, they're, they may be emailing them out, or they may be mailing them out, but they're doing it on one, you know, have to look it up on the case and have to do it. The system now, the back end system, you know, it can take care of all of that and automatically send out those things. It does also eliminate that scanning and manual indexing. And like I said before, it, it, it provides a lot more level of automation um, when you're going mandatory. Because again, you have one single spot to have to worry about where things are coming from. Um, usability and design, you do have to keep in mind a wide variety of different types of, of users that are going to be filing in the system. Um, right now, um, from true filing standpoint, we're really dealing most with the top two, um, the various practice types you know, and sizes. So we have, we have some law firms that, ha that are, are multi-jurisdictional areas, you know, uh, 
We have, for instance, the, um, the district attorney of the state of Michigan. You know, they've got offices in, in all over the state. And so we have some that are from Lansing, some that are from downtown Detroit. They're all filing on cases to the various courts that we're dealing with. But it's a large enough entity where they have multiple users, multiple administrators, multiple logons, all the way down to people who um, are sole proprietors. Um, you know, that are just a single person. They are the lawyer. They are the person that used to run it down to the courthouse. They're the ones that do, that that does everything. They have no legal staff or helpers. Um, and then government entities. So we do have the internal filers, the people who are allowed to file um, internally, whether they be the judges or even some prosecutors. If you know anything about our e, our I Justice suite, we do have um, true filing for law enforcement. So we allow those type of things. Um, indigent, though, you know, you have to be very um, concerned about those that um, should be paying but maybe are not eligible to pay. So those that, uh, that maybe qualify because of some financial constraints or some, some issues, um, being able to support indigent um, filing or filers. And then pro se and pro per, um, that falls into another category, which again, if you were part of Judge Rogers, you of course slammed personally me of not having this in in time, which I will now rebuttal without him here to defend himself by saying that he was the one that actually made the request not to put it in because he didn't want it, because he was thinking about doing a demo of the system and he didn't want any chance of any change because it was supposed to go in on the first. And he's like, well, if I'm giving a demo on the sixth, don't touch it, so anyway. Um, and process servers, so email, you know, that, that's one way to serve out documents. But there are some, if you're talking about property disputes, you know, there are some types of servicing that email might not cut it, that you actually have to do still some paper sign or um, servicing. Um, if it's something where it's gonna go in a criminal, where somebody is going to have a, um, uh, something uh, served to them by a law enforcement agency or by a police officer, you know, those type of things, so you need to, to accommodate those types of filers as well because they're going to have to file a proof of service back. Um, and those are sort of some of the next stages that we're going to be looking at from true filing, but just be cognizant that whatever system you're going to be going for or from an e-filing, you really have to think about not just the law firms and the lawyers, but there are other types of filers that are out there. Um, and the different types of features. What's different for what true filing was from the very beginning, we always envisioned this as being sort of a, a much larger than just one court. Most of our competitors, um, Oakland County is an example, they have one system that is just for their court. And then the exact same company made the one for Wayne County, but it's a completely separate system. So even though it's the same company that implemented both of them, they have two different user interfaces, two different sets of, of accounts on file, and the law firms have to register to them. It's a complete nightmare for some of those, those customers. For us, the same users that file to Ottawa County are the same ones that file to Grand Traverse or the same ones that file to Leland or Antrim. It does not matter to us. And so we have law firms that have signed up that actually have, have, have given to multiple jurisdictions. <clears throat> so some of the features that they must have, printable receipts, timely notifications, blah, 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 all those types of things. Um, it's very critical though that there is that, that feedback back to them. Um, you know, be, and we'll get more into this in the communication side, but you know, if they're, they're no longer standing there in front of the counter, and they're no longer getting the instant gratification of having a timestamped version back in their hands, so they can take it back to either the lawyer who really submitted it, or um, maybe the, uh, you know, if it's their, themselves, to be able to put in their own case file. Um, so it's really important to, that they get some copy of that timestamp and access to sort of the case information. A lot of them though, um, the downloadable forms isn't as much of a big deal until you start getting to self, um, uh, like the pro se and the pro per, the ones that are trying to maybe represent themselves in a divorce, um, you know, th then having the downloadable forms is nice. Um, but a lot of them do actually like the favorites and the personalized settings, being able to sort of select their cases and stuff. Yes? Is that like a blank form, or is it pre-filled with case data? It's a blank form right now, but the intent is, um, especially if, if there's going to be a statewide system, of being able to have it so it can actually pull some of that data and, and pre-populate it. 
But yeah, as of right now, it is just, it's really just redirecting them to the SCAO state forms. <clears throat> Yep. On true copying, no, not actually certified, but um, like an order signed by a judge. Yep. And are you talking that you're emailing that and then out to the attorney? Because mm -hmm. right now, when they hand us the paper file, they have their original on top and two, three, or four copies underneath. If they don't have copies, we charge them for those copies. You could do one of two. I mean, you as a court can always decide how you want to actually handle that. Um, for the 13th Circuit, I can say that they are actually emailing a courtesy copy to all parties on file. They don't give any additional copies or anything like that. Okay. Um, the only charge that they would be doing in that case is going to be when they start doing certified copies, so it'll actually be a certified copy. But yeah, once the cat's out of the bag and they have got one copy, they can go ahead and make as many copies as they want. It's not a true copy, it's just exactly. a it's not, an yeah. email copy. Exactly. You have the stamp on it if you need to take it somewhere. Correct. Now, the true certify side, which would be sort of a analogous of a stamped or at least a raised sealed copy um, that one um, part of again what Dan wanted and what we envisioned for the certified documents is um, to have you know a couple things right now what's implemented is a sort of a time bomb like this this is only valid for X number of days mm -hmm. so that window can be and I believe you guys have it set to 90 days don't you yeah you can do anything you yeah, you can do whatever you want. So you can do one day, it could be valid for 30 days. And, and the valid part of that means, if you actually look at it, it has a, a URL that's on there and a couple little other document locator IDs and encryption key and even has a cutesy QR code so you can do it with a mobile device. But it takes you to a website that actually will validate and show you, present you with the document that it should be. So you can visually look at, well, this is what they said, this is what it is. Once that timestamp occurs, when they go to that URL, it'll tell them that document's no longer valid. So now it's up to the person who's accepting it to, to either take it for face value or, you know, they can do it. But yeah, I mean, that's once... Cert, yeah, that's certified. I'm just thinking of, like, just your standard copies. No, nope. standard copies, it's, you know, it, you're pretty much, it's out, out the door. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Yep, no, it's fine. Um, automation. So if you're requiring... The e-service, you know, well, from our standpoint, what we've what we saw is that requiring e-service can allow you now to gain some additional pieces, which are the automatic generation of proof of service. So I said before, you know, the intent is there, and they can mark down who they sent it. But if they didn't put it in the mailbox, they can always say, well, I put it in the mailbox. The mail must have, you know, lost it. You know, it's all about intent. Well, in this particular case, the automatic proof of service, it'll do. You know, as soon as you create that, or as soon as the emails are sent, it'll create that proof of service for all the people that it sent it to. So if you sent it to five people, the proof of service will show you five people with their email addresses, you know, and the location, what law firm they go to, and so forth. Um, if you actually um, add more people to serve it to, because you can always serve more people, and the, you know, oh, I forgot that person, so I'll add another person, it'll generate another proof of service. So you might keep getting these automatic automatic proof of service is generated and sent down. But every type of time that you're doing that, and every time it sends out those servicing, it's going to send that proof of service for you. So, you know, some of the law firms were looking at and saying, well, I could always just, you know, send something to my brother-in-law just to show him what type of goofball this is. Well, if you're going to serve them, it's going to show up on record that you sent your brother-in-law's email address, you know, this particular thing. So there's no more hiding about what's going on. But what it allows you to do also is you can automate that docketing because it's not an image. You know, you can have this be data only. I now know all the email recipients and now you can start mining that data and making sure that maybe there's some lawyer who is notorious for not serving certain people or certain other lawyers and only doing it to their, you know, paralegal staff or, or shoving it to some other counsel that, um, you know, from the letter of the law is okay to be serving but this allows you to do a little bit more stuff. And also allows you to sort of map those document types into docket codes. So again, whether or not you're talking about just proof of service, but any type of documents, um, you know, you've got to leverage that automation side too. What am I doing? Man, I'm behind. <clears throat> Luckily, I think this is one of the smaller ones. Um, so starting with a pilot program. So, I mean, all of our times that, you know, you really do have to start with something just to sort of vet out any types of issues. 
I mean, it, it makes logical sense. You know, let people adjust to it. You can address your issues proactively. Um, and really what you want to do is you want to kind of limit the, the law firms and the cases that you're going to do for e-filing. So just sort of open it up to a select few and then just sort of see how it works out. This really, what we've seen is if it's longer than a month, you probably, you know, they're, if they're not forced to get into it and forced to do it, and you know, there's not that much activity that really goes on in, in cases that um, you're not gonna get too much, but at least it helps sort of get things going. The, the key thing though is that if you really want to, you know, sort of go, again, if you're making it mandatory, you can always start with just limited case types. And so as an example, the civil ones, those are sort of the easier ones, the C, N, and A, and P case types. So, you know, just the regular civil and the negligence and those types. Um, you know, those, those are pretty easy to do. And there's a lot enough, there's a good enough volume there in order to go through the system. And they're also predominantly from law firms. Um, you know, at least these are from, from law firms. When you get into divorce with minors, um, that's when you're going to have to have that pro per or the pro se type filers because you know you're going to have a lot, maybe even more than half of them are going to be self, you know, um, done. Um, what's interesting about this though, and, and we are actually thinking about this, and it does make sense. The cases, the, the load on the system becomes pretty stat static. I mean, if you think about it, once you've chosen your case types, you know, pretty much every day how many documents are going to be filed. We know that if we see more than X number of documents filed in a day, something's wrong. If we see less than X number of documents per day being filed, we know something's wrong. Because it's basically every day is around about the same range of stuff. And that's because the amount of constituents, the amount of cases, the amount of stuff that's going on for a given jurisdiction is pretty well defined. Whether it's gonna be paper or it's gonna be electronic, it goes through. So what's nice about that is that you know adding more case types you know, it, it, it's a pretty smooth process. You kind of know what you have. You know that things are going well. You're not going to get any more. You're not going to get any less from that. Start to add some more case types. Let's see what happens. Let's see what the impact is on that. If you start with too many, you may overwhelm everyone. You know, again, if you're going mandatory, it would be nice to have everything mandatory, but at the same time, it would be a little chaotic to have all those processes done. Um, the multiple courts, we talked about that. One of the things, though, is to, to really think about those SEAO standards and the, the online forms. The biggest thing is that you know, what we've seen is we made a flexible system. And in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have made it as flexible as we did. Um, and what I mean by that is you know, civil documents and for a C case type or a negligence case type, it's pretty much known at the state level what you're supposed to file. We know what the prices are going to be. We know what a description is. You know, we allow a lot of flexibility for it, but in reality, what Ottawa has is virtually identical to what Grand Traverse has. And we really should stick to what the state has, because that's what the filers know about. And even though we have a unified system where they always log on as one, the, the fact of the matter is, is that they actually um, might be confused by going from one jurisdiction to the other with the same type of case type. So try to keep all the case types really to what everybody has. The other thing is, is industry standards. It's not as much as what you guys are going to have to worry about so much as more of the technological side of things. But do be conscious about, you know, and this is where the start small, think big. If you were to start, you know, big and think about all these things, it's very daunting. And we, we made the conscious decision to not be all of these standards at the very get-go, but we do actually are supporting these standards now, you know, and it's been six months later. But the key thing is, is that there are specifications out there. There's a lot of great material about what it means to make an ECF compliant, which is an electronic case filing um, compliant system. And the benefits to that are that you are, well, if you don't support it, you're going to limit your, your, your expansion to other departments. And the biggest one is reducing the ability to integrate into other systems. When you're talking about law enforcement, and you're talking about maybe the appeals court, and you're talking about you know, um, integration even into case management systems and any of the other third party stuff, um, it's very critical that, you know, you sort of support those standards. And thankfully, true filing, we do actually support those. And the other one, although this would be good for us, but, you know, you certainly don't want that to be necessarily true. You know, you are locking yourself in, so you certainly wouldn't want to do that, wouldn't want to do that. 
Apparently, I'm not uh, too far behind. <clears throat> um, open communication. Be prepared to go that extra mile. It is very amazing as to, um, you know, th there are other systems out there, whether it's Pacer, whether it's something else. The key thing, though, is that we've shown some empathy. Just calling back a filer, they have been amazed. They've said, why are you calling back? I was like, well, you opened up a support ticket. I'm like, yeah, we didn't think we'd actually hear from you. Um, you know, just the fact of just answering their call, listening to them, understanding what their problem is, and trying to come up with either a workaround or being able to uh, explain to them how to actually use the system, it has diffused so many um, people that, that, that the initial thought would be, man, this person's going to be hostile. But in reality, they've actually become very good advocates of the system. Some of them are going to need special attention. There are, a lot, there are people out there that have no idea um, you know, how computers actually work and you know, how the internet works and stuff. And they do need a little, you know, some extra tender love and care. And that's the problem is that the 80% of our time is probably spent with 20% of the people. But you gotta make sure that you can accommodate them. And a lot of it does have to do with misinterpretation. Some of them don't think that the generated proof of service really constitutes as proof of service. And they're steadfast on sending an actual proof of service in. More power to you, the judge has told you 50 million times you don't have to, but you know, they just don't understand. <coughs> The key thing is, is that you still need to interact. They, the filers need to interact with it. Um, the, your conversation is gonna change. So if you're on the clerk side of it, and you're no longer looking at it, you have to realize that there's no way to change even minor fixes anymore. If they forgot to sign something, unfortunately, it's gotta be rejected now. They can't just physically sign it there and be able to send it in. I mean, what they send in, it's gotta be pure. And that's hard for them to realize, and it's kind of rude to just send back saying, reject. You know, you've got to sort of tell them what to do and hold their hands a little bit more through messaging. So you really have to worry um, a little bit more about the conversational messaging and almost picture them standing in front of you what you would say to them. Because, you know, sometimes they're like, they just rejected. They didn't tell me why. Well, you know, we got to do it. Statuses and upda updates and stuff. The other thing is, and Judge Rogers is very, very good with this from that standpoint. Um, and I know Dan Kruger and his team, you know, they've got a wonderful technical staff and stuff. But, you know, we try to solicit that feedback often. We try to be sincere about it. And most of the time we found that people are, as long as we're open to, to listening to it, they've been very responsive and very patient with us. Um, and the thing is, is that no system is going to be flexible. But we do have to make sure that we follow up on what we say that we're going to do. And that's one of the things that even as a clerk or as a, as a court, you know, you got to sort of, you know, figure out, you know, the, the right way of being able to resolve some of these. Um, most of them can be handled via workarounds. Some of them need to be it. What we've really found, though, for us, is that what's important to us might not be what's important to the filers. And the filers are really the ultimate people that are using this. And we've had to reprioritize. There are certain things that I'd love to be able to fix right now, but they're just not a priority for what the filers have. And we've got to fix what the filers need because they're the ones that ultimately are using it. Um, encouraging the adoption, just breeze through this, offer the, the training sessions. Um, but the big thing is, is leveraging the local and state bar associations. Um, they hold those annual meetings and, or quarterly meetings and stuff. Um, and you know, what's been beneficial is actually attending those and soliciting the feedback and also telling them that, look, this is coming up the line. Who wants to actually be um, in there? And the thing is, is to continually communicate because they're always changing lawyers. So you can't just do it once and think that you're done. You're always going to have different lawyers and different people that are, that are in there. Any questions? As I fire hose through that last part. <laughs> Any questions? Concerns? No? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the entire summit.